Good morning, everyone. This is Jay Schnitzer speaking. It's 11 o'clock Eastern time, so we're going to begin on time. I know there are several still logging on, uh, but we will, we will start right now. Thank you. I am here on behalf of Dr. John Halamka and the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition. As you probably know, the coalition began just two and a half weeks ago as a private sector initiative to save lives by providing real-time learning to preserve healthcare delivery and protect populations in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Part of that response has been development of the website you're about to see, complete with data, analytics, and connections within, which we will demonstrate in this session. In a moment, I will turn the microphone over to my colleague, Dr. Uh, Steve Foote, who has led the development of this website to, grab, to guide you through this demo. Because of the large number of attendees to this session, all microphones are muted and will remain so during the session. If you have any questions or comments, please provide them through the chat feature of this Zoom webcast. And lastly, to preserve uh, bandwidth in this session, I would ask all participants turn off your video cameras, please. We don't need video feeds, and that'll preserve bandwidth for the delivery. So with that, I will turn it over to Steve Foote. Steve, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schnitzer. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Steve Foote. Welcome to this demonstration of the Coalition's website, including its collaboration features and its rapidly expanding resource library. So what you're going to see during the demonstration is the result of the initial two weeks of effort by the Coalition to, number one, instantiate the Coalition's web presence. Number two, implement a contact relationship management system for facilitating the onboarding of new members. Number three, catalog a comprehensive set of relevant healthcare data sources for sharing. Number four, organize multiple parallel working groups focused on several of the most challenging issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. Number five, formulate hypotheses for effectively dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Number six, create models and analytics for validating our hypotheses and craft actionable recommendations. And lastly, to document and share these recommendations and best practices to the greatest extent possible. So with that, let's get moving on in. This currently being shared is the front door of the coalition. The website's being updated frequently. You can actually see, you've just heard from Dr. Jay Schnitzer. There's a chief medical officer uh, corner over here on the right. Another thing I'd like to call attention to is an ever-expanding list of coalition members. Uh, the list is much longer than that. We'll get into that in just a few moments. These are some of the coalition members that uh, have allowed the coalition to actually utilize their name out on the front of the website. Now, uh, another quick point. The website is actually mobile friendly, um, and that's uh, in particular to support our healthcare colleagues out on the front line in this fight. Um, so it works on uh, Android, it works on Microsoft, it works on Apple phones. Um, the full functionality is available. Now, real quick, one of the things that the general public and certainly many of you on this phone call here uh, have uh, actually already utilized is the resource library. The resource library is robust, as you can see, capable of a faceted search over here on the left hand side, as well as a keyword search, um, sortable by every one of the columns here. And um, paginating at the moment, I think we have, it continually updates, but I think we're at 78 published um, uh, information sources, whether it's dashboard or data service, data sets and whatnot. Let's take a quick look at um, one of those. I've uh, cached for the purposes of expediency, this particular document, which was brought to our attention from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, this is the McDermott and Consulting document, which is a compilation of all of the waivers with regard to sharing healthcare information here in the United States. You can actually sort it by the agency. I'll just show you there's CMS, there's FDA, the General Accounting Office, HHS. 
state, the White House, whatnot, it's comprehensive listing of the waivers that are going to facilitate the sharing of healthcare information, um, certainly amongst the coalition members, but um, uh, whether they're coalition members or not doesn't really matter. Um, the next one I would like to show you is, we'll call this one up, and I've jumped over here to the news and insights. We'll come back here towards the end of the briefing with the, um, the evaluation of uh, N95 respirators and the cleansing of those. I wanted to show you some other assets on here, which are a little bit out of the traditional, just to show you the range of what we've got in the way of content availability. McKinsey and Company has published a briefing note for COVID-19. And let's take a quick peek at what that has in store for us. It's a very rich document actually um, targeted here to uh, help senior leaders understand the COVID-19 situation and how it may unfold, as well as take steps to protect their employees, customers, supply chains, and the financial results. Just to show the breadth and depth of this particular one, I jump you down to the tail end of the document where um, this is as of March 25th. You can see a leading indicator dashboard. And again, the audience here is, is uh, business leaders. Break it down through major geographic locations with some significant um, uh, numerical analysis associated with that. So not your you know, typical um, document. I, I just wanted to show you the range, if you will, like waivers as well as business documents. Now, with that, let's move a little bit deeper in. So many of you have already joined the coalition. There's over 480 in the coalition as of right now or in stages of joining the coalition. This is the uh, sign up form. And for those of you who have not already done the sign up, it's pretty straightforward. There are really only these five guiding principles to joining the coalition. It's very, very simple. There's no contracts, there's no commitments, there's no money exchanged and whatnot. What the coalition does ask for is information about what types of data or service that you might be providing, whether it's data, analytic tools, or action services. And that's to get a better sense for how each inbound member of the coalition will be able to bring their resources to bear. To manage all of that, we've actually been donated from salesforce.com, the contact relationship management tool through which we're actually tracking all of the organizations and all the individuals that we're dealing with over time as they um, move forward with becoming a member of the coalition. This is tremendously useful to make sure that uh, no one falls through the cracks and we have productive communication streams uh, once we've established that. Um, the the three data analytics and actions from over here on the Join the Coalition page has actually produced a remarkable wealth of response. You can't read this, don't try. The, the visual is purely for effect. The effect here is, and if I can remember my zooms, just to show you, that is what we jokingly refer to as a minus three point font or a, a legal font. Um, there's real content. Um, it is incredible what um, the partners have been bringing to the table in the way of available data, analytics, and the actions that they're able to take. You'll notice this is a, you know, obviously two-dimensional matrix here. The other matrix uh, uh, axis is, is got to do with the patient's journey, starting with the general population um, and whether they're infected or not their discovery that they've been infected either through symptoms or through a positive test, the um, visit to the emergency room and possibly becoming an inpatient, and then lastly, the recovery through their journey. So that's another aspect of the catalog and the richness that the members are providing each other to, through the coalition. Again, really just for a fact. So let me take you back over here. We're gonna take a, a quick look at the resource library again. I had mentioned the faceted searches and the like. Um, you'll notice that it's healthcare providers, um, uh, commercial uh, entities, nonprofits, government entities. In this particular case, I've launched the Athena Health dashboard just to show you um, uh, a little bit of some of the data that's available outside of the storage confinement that the coalition's standing up. So obviously 
members are bringing a wealth of, of uh, technologies in. This particular one happens to be the labs ordered through the Athena Health and lab data from clinicians using Athena Health's EHR platform starting from the beginning of the year, but essentially in March. It's a good illustration of a geospatial as well as a temporal view of the data. Uh, I'm, I'm using fairly straightforward ones. We'll, we'll get a, a little bit more sticky here as, as we go deeper in, but um, the user's actually able to watch the growth of the lab tests being ordered across the United States. And as we begin to aggregate this information, we'll combine the Athena information with that coming from other EHRs to provide even a, a more holistic view of what's going on um, across the United States. Now that's an example of data that's actually stored outside the coalition. Right now, we've got over 500 data sets that we are rapidly cataloging. Um, we are determining the metadata associated with that information and uploading it into a short, a, excuse me, a shared storage location, multiple actually, donated by Google and Amazon. This is the upload page in its current form. It's changing all the time, but just to give you a sense for how we're starting to catalog some of this information that we're uploading into the site and whether or not there's PII and PHI involved with the, um, the data itself. The coalition does have access through one or more of the members to um, through HIPAA compliant storage mechanisms to store PII and PHI information respectively. So just one more time before I leave this page, over 500 data sets, we are loading them aggressively, cataloging them, some are small, some are the size of a spreadsheet, some are multiple terabytes and bordering on petabytes. So substantial amount of compute resources made available to the coalition through the donations of some of the technology partners. Now, let's go inside. Microsoft's donated a tenant called Microsoft Teams, a tenant of Microsoft Teams, which is a collaboration site that provides the ability for the coalition to instantiate working groups as teams. And these are, this is live, these teams exist right now in the coalition site. I'm gonna walk through this uh, demo one here in a bit more detail as we get further in, <clears throat> but I thought I'd you know, take you for a quick tour, if you will. So we've got um, working group analytics, we've got clinical data standards, we've got the ICU ventilation management. Here's the N95 one. Just for those of you that are not familiar with the uh, uh, Microsoft Teams app, <clears throat> I'm in the browser. There is a thick client which you'll be able to utilize. The browser is, you know, 100% functional, so there's no reason you would have to download the thick client. Just to give you um, a quick once through, so there are posts. Think of it as a linear chat. If you join tomorrow and become a member of the N95 working group, you'll actually see all the history prior to you joining. Each one of the working groups is gonna have multiple initiatives or projects. The projects are actually channels. That's the term inside of Microsoft. We can add a channel. Each channel might be focused on particular areas of opportunity, mask reusability, upscaling the production, mask, effic mask efficacy, and the supply chain associated with personal protective equipment. Each one of these channels can have multiple tabs across the top. The defaults are obviously chat, the ability to share files um, in the cloud uh, securely as well as backed up, the ability to run a wiki to be, you know, persistent. You think of this as notes pages. Um, Lauren, it happens to be the, the um, team lead for this particular one. Uh, if I recall, yes, uh, it, I think it is anyway. But nevertheless, um, let me just show you a little bit more of the capabilities here. We're able to add in a wide number of tools to any one of those tabs that might be um, suitable for the team's need or for the particular project's need. My point in showing you this is not necessarily to give you a tutorial inside of Teams, but rather to show you the extensiveness of the capability that the coalition teams and the individual projects have at their disposal. So with that, let's take a quick peek at, um, and actually here, let me 
pull this back up again. Let me show you this particular one on non-pharmaceutical interventions. So here's what's going on. <clears throat> Coalition's been up and running for two weeks. We've had this tenant up for, I believe, 24 hours. <laughs> so that's why you don't see most of the working group. Much of the working group's efforts to date have been through phone calls and through private emails. So there's an extensive amount of uh, communication and collaboration that's being shifted over. There is an MPI working group already, and um, they are not yet moved over into the teams. They may be doing so shortly, but in the meantime, and we may see them pop up here if that's the case. In the meantime, what I've done is I've instantiated a demonstration NPI team to show how we might manage the working group collaboration. With each one of the teams, there's a general um, <clears throat> uh, section, if you will, and all the posts, you can see the posts of where I you know, produced the channels um, uh, just yesterday. The channels, uh, in this case, the projects, might be broken out into um, these four categories. And these are notional, but not entirely. They're falling a little bit um, along the nature of what the working group is doing. NPI, <clears throat> non-pharmaceutical interventions. I, you know, I apologize. I'll try to do my uh, my best to keep up with the acronyms for those of us in the audience that might not know what the acronyms are. NPI detection and discovery, <clears throat> and we'll dive into that. Each one can have multiple tabs associated with that. This one is natural language processing. This one might be microformat based, um, published uh, from the you know providers. Um, a channel to discuss the cataloging of uh, NPIs, a channel to discuss the adherence and the notifications of the NPIs, and then possibly a final one, the efficacy analysis and analytics of the NPIs. Let me show you the sort of um, content that we might have in each one of these areas. So let's start with the uh, NPI cataloging, if we will. So the coalition has cataloged the fact that the National Governors Association has a website focused on coronavirus. And on that website, they're already tracking the steps that the individual United States have taken to address the coronavirus, as well as the steps that the federal government have taken to address the coronavirus. Wealth of resources here available to us. One of those is this spreadsheet, which catalogs each of the states and provinces and all of the NPIs that have been taken. And I say all, but I need to qualify that because these are generally associated with uh, governmental um, activity. Let me just show you the extent that we can query this. So National Guard activation it might be interesting to know which states have not activated the National Guard. Alaska, Missouri, Nebraska, Nevada, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Utah, and the Virgin Islands. Mm, that's handy. Um, another one that we might look at is uh, over this way. If we take a look at the, let's look at the individual states maybe. Let's see what, and there's malice to my forethought here because I will show you some more about Louisiana in just a few moments, but not a lot going on for Louisiana. Hmm. If we go back and select everything, we can actually um, see that you know there's there's tremendous going on you know in other states. A lot of these columns are populated, so that that theme will come up again in a few minutes. Um, and I'm doing some some of this for the dramatic effect here. But so what was not on that on that list? were things like um, events, the Boston Marathon being canceled and whatnot. So this team, this working group, has tapped into natural language processing. This is a tool from one of the coalition members known as Sedimentier. Sedimentier actually catalogs using natural language processing a wealth of information coming from the internet, all various sources. You can subselect which countries, you can subselect the nature of the information, you can subselect the uh, or origin, but it's doing natural language processing to actually discover, in this case, COVID related, that's the first wild card, NPIs, that's the second wild card. 
Um, this is a pretty significant analytic, and this allows us to catalog and discover NPIs, both those that have been published, as we just saw with the National Governors Association, as well as those that have not been picked up, whether it's uh, seniors' hours at the local shopping centers um, or, uh, you know, uh, church services or local county has shut down the county fair, things of that nature. Those are all relevant, especially when we get to the point where we're beginning to undo the NPIs. So in this particular case, the results of the natural language processing produces a wealth of information. Um, event canceled, university closed, mass gathering restrictions. So you can tell some of these are governmental and then others are not. This type of information is incredibly useful to the researchers and the uh, analysts who are gonna be looking at the efficacy of the NPIs as we move forward with this particular working group. And by the way, I'm not suggesting this is the only one. I'm really just showing this uh, example, both the catalog and the natural language to show the compendium of approaches of gathering data using, you know, potentially novel approaches in the healthcare space. Another example would be this one here where the team back over here has actually been working on cataloging that information and then doing some human analysis on it. And you'll see a visualization here, which is a week old at the moment, but um, this visualization actually shows the user the relative comparisons of a subset of the number of states they're you know, uh, currently implementing. And obviously there's been several more since the, uh, the 24th of March, but it's just another way of uh, illustrating that type of content. I'm gonna take you back over to Teams and just show you that, you know, it, there's the ability to share files, as I've mentioned before, and to share the catalogs, as I've mentioned before. So this information can be stored here for further discussion, iteration, the, um, the filtering that you, you just saw on those spreadsheets, I've actually implemented myself to make it easier for the analysts to actually sort through the, um, the documents. These documents can be opened for shared right access as well. So there's a incredible amount of, of capability um, with the collaboration environment. I'm gonna take you a little further in and let's take a look at yet another of the coalition's efforts. This one is two coalition members, three actually. So let me, while this refreshes, I'll give you uh, um, the background knowledge here that this happens to be a Tableau interface. Um, the Tableau interface, uh, Tableau is a coalition member and is donating their technologies to support this initiative. The, the information is a combination of one of of the coalition members and one of the universities, which I won't mention only because I don't know that I can mention their name just yet, but to give you um, a little bit of uh, background here, this is content coming in from the CDC, the American Academy of Physicians, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the U.S. Census Bureau. The content has actually been run through a model, and you can see once again, as I started earlier in the session with um, the very popular geospatial laydown, this particular one being a heat map. But in this case, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna draw your attention to the state of Louisiana. Um, we know that uh, in part because of Mardi Gras, but um, in, in part because of the population um, dynamics down there, that the New Orleans area is actually potentially one of the next hotspots. And what I'm doing is I'm just zooming in for effect here, but I'm gonna call your attention to the scatter plot over here on the right-hand side. On the x-axis is the vulnerability index percentile, and on the y-axis is the population. And every one of these is a county in the state of Louisiana. Um, without filtering it, we'd see the, all of the US. The point here is that all of the counties in this upper right-hand quadrant are currently at the highest risk for a disastrous pandemic outbreak because their population, based upon the information sources I referred to just a moment ago, have the highest vulnerability index percentile. And in particular, there's a lot of them. This is a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. So this information would become useful um, to potentially a number of entities. Let's take a look at what the results of that team have uh, been. This one's not posted. This one's kind of hot off the press. Um, this is sorted by 
the vulnerability index. And you can see these highlighted are the top 20 most vulnerable counties across the United States. Um, for those of you who are wondering, I'll scroll down to the bottom and you can see if you're in the least vulnerable counties in the United States. Um, uh, I happen to be speaking to you from very close to the bottom of the list in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so I consider myself fortunate, but I'm very seriously considering a move to Tampa, excuse me, not Tampa, to Napa, California. Now, what might we do with this content? Well, we might share it with the federal government when they begin to distribute masks domestically. Um, to the highest risk households. We might share it with the healthcare providers so that they can begin to flex their resources um, accordingly uh, to try and marshal resources to the areas that are needed the most when they get the hardest hit. Um, the, the, that type of an insight is where the coalition is um, looking to make an impact. And it's just this, this is a small example. The work, I'm barely touching the, um, the tip of the iceberg right now when it comes to the work that the um, the coalition and all the working groups are doing. Uh, and um, you're gonna see that blossoming very quickly here in the near future. Um, one more analytic to share with everyone. In this particular case, the, um, uh, this is another uh, example of uh, collaboration amongst uh, uh, two or three, I'm forgetting, it's at least two anyway, of um, the coalition providers. Uh, I'm able to actually select a state and choose the interventions from NPI's perspective, whether or not social distancing is implemented, individual hygiene, the availability of personal protective equipment. And for the sake of the demonstration, I'll actually just go live and I'll run. This is, this is the breakdown of the infected curve over you know, the population. And this uh, flat line out here to the right, that's actually the percentage of the population or the, the raw number of the population that will actually eventually be deceased based upon this prototypical model. If I zero in on the fatalities, let's see what happens when I actually apply social distancing, but only slightly effective. And let's save that. And we'll run it a little farther over and see what the difference is there. Save that. Run it a little farther over. And I think you're all getting my point. This is a wonderful tool to actually visualize the impact that the social distancing NPI has on the overall population and more specifically on the mortality rate associated with COVID-19. So the coalition's gonna to continue to produce a number of these technologies. As I mentioned before, and I'll stress it one more time, we have well over 500 data sets being cataloged, just under 100 so far, um, and that's in the coalition's cloud. Then there's hundreds more that the care providers like the Mayo Clinics and the Athena Healths and uh, the Epics of the world have um, already have access to themselves. The working groups are gonna be looking for opportunities to collaborate, to share data, to, to um, store that data co-located for the purposes of running um, more intensive analytics. Let me show you one more aspect of the, there we go, just before we wrap up, of what the working groups have done by collaborating across a large number of entities. This was just published. The date is yesterday. It's an evaluation of contamination techniques for the reuse of the N95 respirators. And the work has been done inside of the N95 working group. You'll all be able to access this. It's not, you know, password protected or anything, but I'll just scroll down to the bottom and, and you know, sort of net it out for you. You'll actually see um, what I believe is the only um, currently published, you know, there's an appendix associated with the methods of decontamination. So this type of content is tremendously useful for the healthcare providers to be able to see and compare the overview and the considerations with each of the methods of decontamination associated with the N95 respirators. This is the type of content that we hope to continue to proliferate as much as possible. Um, you'll notice it's not directive. It's not meant to be directive. We're not attempting to say the best way because 
the coalition is not going to know what any individual care provider or hospital has in the way of a microwave oven or the uh, isopropanol uh, or, you know, for that matter, low-tech low bleach. Um, the purpose isn't to be directive. The purpose is to be um, informative and informative in as um, open, as collaborative, and as educated a way as is possible. So with that, I'm going to begin to minimize this back down. We're going to wrap it up here. And if I could just give me one moment and find Dr. Jay Schnitzer in the list, and I will unmute Dr. Schnitzer and have him give us some closing comments. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate uh, your running through this for all of the po folks on. We had over 400 online, so thank you all for listening. Uh, I posted in the chat window the web address for the coalition site. Please, if you haven't already, go there and explore some more. For those of you who want to join the coalition, it's very simple. Uh, just follow the instructions on the uh, joining uh, box and you're in. Um, and once you do that, you are part of the coalition. It's that simple. And you have access to everything on the site. Please also know that this is under very rapid development. So there are additions going in on a daily basis in terms of data data, feeds, <clears throat> new analytics, and uh, pointers to other sites as well. And we would invite everybody to help contribute to this uh, effort in any way that you think is useful for the fight against COVID-19. So thank you again for all for joining us, and uh, we will